Okay, so this is a tough problem. The problem is to say, I'm going to start with some path, and I want this B to slide down this path with no friction. And the question is, what path would take the least amount of time to get to some point x2, y2? So not how long it would take, but what's the path? And that's, that's the tough part, because you could do a max-min problem um, where you're trying to solve for some variable, but here we're trying to solve for the function that minimizes an interval. That's tough, because the function is the path. What's the path? So I could set up an integral if I have some little piece of the path ds, and I know the velocity is traveling, then I can integrate the velocity over each piece, and I can find the total time. So it would be the integral uh, from the beginning to the end of ds over the velocity. Okay. So now the question is, what is ds? Um, ds is the relationship between x and y, and that's what we're going to define as the path. Uh, so, but I, I don't know what that is. But I do know that if this is the x-axis and that's the y-axis, then ds would be the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. It's got to be in the x and the y direction. These are perpendicular, so these all make a triangle. I can write that. Now, but I can't do an integral, a one integral, with both dx and dy. So I can write dx equals um, dx dy times dy. And so I'm going to write that as x prime dy, where x prime is the derivative of x with respect to y. So now I can rewrite my ds function. This is going to get messy. I'm going to raise the board several times. You've been warned. Okay. The battery might run out of the camera. That's how long this may take. But we're going to do it until we do it. Right. Okay. So this is going to be equal to uh, the square root of dx squared is going to be x prime squared. I'm going to factor out the dy plus 1 dy. And so I can put that in for my ds, but I'm still, I have, a, I have an x prime, that's an x prime squared. Uh, and I have a dy, that's good, uh, but I have that v, and v changes. So if I think about this in terms of energy, and I say it starts up here at u with zero potential energy and zero kinetic energy, then the potential down here plus the kinetic has to be zero too. So that means that one half m v squared equals uh, m g y. That has to be true. And so if that's the case, then v is the square root of two g y. Okay. So now I can put all those things together, and I get t equals the integral of square root x prime squared plus 1 dy over the square root of 2gy. And then just for simplification, 1 over the square root of 2g, square root x prime squared, that's, I hate writing that, but I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, over the square root of y, dy. Okay, so now the question is, what's the relationship between x and y such that this integral gives me, and this is from now 0 to y2, because we're integrating over y, is a minimum. And that's a tough question. It turns out that if I get this in the form of t equals um, 0, it doesn't really matter the limits, uh, from y1 to y2 of some function of x, x prime, y dy, then we get a stationary solution, which means either a max or a min, if the following is true. The partial of f with respect to x minus the derivative with respect to y of the partial of f with respect to y prime equals zero. And that's the Euler equation. Okay, so I skipped a step. I said, if this is the case, then that has to be true. I didn't derive that. Um, that's, a, that's not trivial to derive. Okay, so I'm not going to derive that because this would take a lot longer. So I'm just going to say that has to be true. And this is, this is the important part. Okay. 
time. And so in that case, what's our f? I, I, I know you're there and you're saying what the f is, but let's just make sure it's clear. f, in this case, is going to be this. So it's the square root of x prime squared plus 1 over y. Okay, okay so the first step is to get this term. So what's the partial of f with respect to, y, to x? Well, there's no x in there. So if I take the partial with respect to x, treating everything else like a constant, I get the partial. This, I told you I was going to erase more than once. So I'm going to erase this. So the partial of f with respect to x is 0. There's no x, f in there. There's no x in there. Now let's do this part, and then we can take the derivative of it. But let's do the partial of f with respect to y prime. So I'm going to write this as the partial with respect to y prime of x prime squared. Oh, wait, that's x prime. I'm sorry. x prime. The partial, so it's x prime squared plus 1 to the 1 half over square root of y, which is a constant in this case, because we're taking the partial respect to x prime. Okay, so this is going to give me um, 1 half times x prime squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half. Now I take the derivative of the stuff inside and I get 2x prime, all that over the square root of y, 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 y. Uh, and so I can, the 2's cancel. And I get x prime over the square root of y times x prime squared plus 1. I can't do this prime squared thing. It's really just, I hate it. What, what am I going to do? x prime squared plus 1. OK, now I need to check to make sure to make a mistake, because I definitely could have. x prime squared plus 1. I have x prime squared. Oh, that's f. Okay, I think that's right. Okay, well, I've run it over here. I don't want to make a mistake again. Okay, I made several mistakes. Okay. So let's just check. That looks good. No, wait, this should be, OK, that's right. OK. So now that's f partial of f with respect to y prime. And that part's 0. So the derivative of this has to be 0, which means that this is a constant. So this has to be a constant. OK. This has to be a constant in order for that to be true. So that means that I'm going to I'm going to do a trick. There's several tricks here that I didn't make up. OK, I, st I steal these tricks. So let's say this. OK, so this has to be equal to a constant. So if I square that, it's still equal to a constant. So I'm going to square that, I get x, uh, x prime squared over y times x prime squared plus 1 equals 1 over 2a. And 1 over 2a is just a constant. There's nothing magic about that. So that's now I want to solve for x prime. OK. So let's do that. Um, let's multiply, cross multiply here. I get 2. No, wait. I'm going to do it anyway. 2a x prime squared equals y x prime squared plus y. I just multiply that out, multiply both sides with the same thing. OK, now I need the x primes on the same side, so I get uh, x prime squared times that. That's not 12. OK. 2a minus y equals y. So now I go x prime squared equals y over, the, over 2a minus y. 
And so x prime is going to be the square root of y over 2a minus y. OK, now I need to go back to where was I before. The integral, why am I doing that? No. Yes. OK, that's right. Got it. OK, so this x prime is equal to dx dy, right? That's how we defined x prime. So I can find x by saying x equals the integral of the square root of y over 2a minus y dy, from y equals 0 to y equals y2. That's all I need to do. Okay, I need to integrate that. Now that's a tough integral, you can look it up. But I'm not going to. I'm going to use another trick. Boom. And this one took me a while to figure out how to, I mean, it took me a while to figure out what to do even after I knew the trick. Okay, so the next trick is to say that um, let y equal a minus a cosine theta, where theta is, theta is just a parameter. Now, if I plug in y into here, and I want to integrate over theta, I'm going to have to get dy in terms of d theta too. So if I take d, just take the derivative of both sides, I get dy equals the derivative of a is a. The derivative of a cosine theta is going to be negative a cosine theta. It's going to be a sine theta d theta. So if I put this and I put this into that, I get x equals the integral of the square root of y, which is going to be a minus, actually, I'm going to write this as just a times 1 minus, uh, I told you this is a tough problem, cosine theta over 2a minus y, which is going to be a plus a cosine theta, and then I have the dy, which is going to be equal to a sine theta d theta. Okay, so this is going to be equal to 2a minus a is just a. And then I get these, this a cancels with these. So now I get x, let's write it over here. I'm taking up a lot of room, but it's a video you can go back in time. Oops, I just threw away my call. So x equals a times the integral of the square root of 1 minus cosine theta over 1 plus cosine theta sine, that's ended right there, sine theta d theta. And I'm done with this. Okay, so if I want to bring that sine into the square root, I have to bring it in as a sine squared theta. So if I remember, if you remember, uh, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. So sine squared theta equals one minus one minus cosine squared theta. Okay. Um, now, I could also do, oh, here, I forget my trick already. Do, I did on the board. Okay. So, I can write <laughs> um, I need to get this to cancel somehow. Sine squared, one minus, so if I have, oh, here, if I multiply the top and the bottom uh, by 1 plus cosine theta, so 1 plus cosine theta times 1 minus cosine theta, it's going to be equal to 1 minus cosine squared theta. Yeah, that's it. So sine squared theta is 1 minus cosine theta uh, squared, which is equal to this. So this is sine squared theta. So I, if I bring sine into the square root, I bring those two things in. Ha, got it. Okay, so I get a 
times the square root of 1 minus cosine theta, and then I get 1 plus cosine theta, 1 minus cosine theta, all that over 1 plus cosine theta, d theta. And then here I go boom, boom, 1 minus cosine theta, 1 minus cosine theta squared, square rooted is equal to a times the integral of 1 minus cosine theta d theta, which is going to be equal to a times theta plus sine theta. Is that right? x equals a, no, it should be minus. There should be an a in there. Yeah, boom. So that's equal to x. So there's my x, and my y is a, what did I say it was? A, here it is. So I have a parameterized relationship between x and y. Okay, I have, if I know theta, I can find x and y, and I just let theta go from whatever to whatever, and this is the answer that I'm going to stop at. And this is what we call a cycloid. Okay, and I'm going to show that in a later video. But I did the part that I wanted to do. Whew, okay.